Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's dialogue entitled Rethinking Urban Agriculture. My name is Chris Lupkeman, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being the leader of the Strategic Foresight Hub within the Office of the President at ETH Zurich. And most importantly for us this evening, I get to be the host for this dialogue. We are again here in the splendid location of the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin. The building which opened in 1889 was built on the site of an ironworks, already a regeneration. It was bombed during World War II. And as, you, as you can see, it has come back again to life, even more life probably than it had before. The Berlin Science Week which I think is a really cool week, which I'm glad to be here, <laughs> provides a forum for scientists and science-driven organizations to engage with the public, share insights into current topics, discuss grand challenges, and envision our future together. And we at the ETH Zurich are very proud to have been part of Berlin Science Week since, since its inaugural edition in 2017. Our dialogue this evening is part of ETH Zurich's Rethinking Living campaign. Many of us have the feeling that we are confronting massive changes in just about every aspect of our lives. Climate change, biodiversity loss, democracy being disputed, global pandemics, wars, technological disruptions are all presenting a clear and present danger to our global society. And more importantly, they also present us with an opportunity to focus on, focusing on finding solutions to these grand challenges, to embrace deeper meaning in our existence, and perhaps to rediscover overlooked aspects of our lives. Rethinking living invites us to touch the core meaning of our humanity, our role in the systems of the world around us, and hopefully to foster a greater sense of purpose. So let's get started to, with tonight's conversation. I am truly honored to be here with three incredible individuals from all sorts of walks of life. First, we have Iris Haberkorn. She is a senior scientist and the project lead of Urban Microalgae Protein Project at the ETH Center in Singapore. There, she's focusing on, with her team, developing sustainable, resilient solutions for food production and processing they're applicable to highly urbanized environments. So let's give a welcome to Iris. Welcome to Berlin. <laughs> Next to her, here in the middle, we have Marcel Graf. Now Marcel is a designer, a filmmaker, an entrepreneur. Right? Right. It's right. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's yeah, right. We're yeah. trying to figure out the, the, the antler here. With the, yeah. And the hunter also, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll get to that. <laughs> now, his career has been shaped by creating atmospheres and emotions, as he says. And nature is his deep and profound inspiration to create unique stories and worlds, which is why he has dedicated himself to the craft of hunting. Welcome, Marcel. Thank you. And finally, at the end here, on the other side, we have Anya Stegley, who's also a local, yes. if I'm not mistaken. True. Yeah? Yeah. All right. She is a landscape architect and transformative researcher. And her work focuses on water-sensitive design, productive landscapes, and practices of participation and embodiment. And very, very fascinating to see what we're going to talk about. So, Anya, welcome. Thank you. So, our time together, that's both here in the room and those online, will be about 75 minutes. And I will stop at 75 minutes in respect to the next group, which is coming. Each of our panelists are going to start off with a few minutes explaining what they do. And then uh, I have a couple questions to be asking them. And you will also be invited to pose questions to any and all of them here. And I suppose you here in the room and online, online on the YouTube, you're welcome to put into the chat, or on the Slido, either one on the website. And we'll take as many questions as we can, and I apologize ahead of time if we don't get to all of them. 
So we'll do our, our very, really, our very, very best. Are we ready? Oh, come on. Are we ready? Can we do the Zoom thing. Yeah! All right. Here we go. All right. So um, how about if we start off with each one of you describing what you do? And perhaps, Iris, what is it you actually do? So uh, I think uh, Chris already mentioned that I'm actually a scientist, a senior scientist uh, that actually comes from ETH Zurich, sustainable food processing. But probably I start with giving you a broader context of what we are doing and why we are doing it. So what is our rationale behind the research that we are doing? And if you look at our agri-food systems, we are actually facing several challenges. So our current agri-food systems are major contributors to anthropogenic climate change. Already now, we are using 70% of the fresh water that is available on our planet. Our agri-food system produces one-third of the global greenhouse gas emissions and is causing our planet to transgress beyond its planetary boundaries. At the same time, we waste one-third of the food that we produce globally with blind, spo blind spots along the whole value chain. And we find billions of or hundreds of people, thousands of people that have uh, uh, malnu uh, malnutrition, um, micronutrient deficiencies. At the same time, our food production would need to increase by 60% if we want to feed a growing world po population, which is estimated to be around 9.7 billion people in 2050. So our group is focusing on finding novel raw materials, such as black soldier fly larvae, so insects, but also single cell based value chains, such as those relying on microalgae. If you don't know what microalgae are, probably a lot of you know what macroalgae are. If you look at uh, sushi, right, you have all these big nori algae from the sea. But we are looking at very tiny microalgae that have the size of bacteria that, can, that are very potent for growing in urbanized environments. And this brings me to the Singapore context. In Singapore, we only have 1% of arable land. However, the governance seeks to find solutions on how we can increase domestic food production in Singapore. Currently, domestic food production is around 10%. And they want to increase this uh, share to 30% by 2030. So we need to find novel solutions on how we can produce food independent of arable land. And also, if we look at the shifts and challenges that we are facing, in 2050, it's estimated that around 80% of the population will live in urbanized environments. So we need to find solutions on how we can produce food in a more sustainable, resilient way um, that is nutritious and affordable for people and that is applicable to highly urbanized environments. And currently, in Singapore, there's a pressing demand to develop this. So therefore, uh, we went to Singapore to develop these solutions for urban food production and processing. Now, just a really quick, but are these, these single cell, the algae is protein or is it carbohydrates or what, what is it actually? It's everything. So a lot of people uh, now at times they focus on protein, but we think of a more holistic way of providing nutritious food and actually inside the microalgae. Depending on the species that you use, you can find up to 70% of protein, but we also have very... Uh, other very nutritious nutrients like uh, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, vitamins, there are also carbohydrates. Uh, some species possess uh, vitamin B12 uh, and antioxidants. So they are very versatile in their composition. Okay, cool. Thank you. Marcel, I think your world is a little different. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> tell us about your world. Yeah, you already introduced me, but uh, I think the reason why I'm here uh, this evening is because I go hunting. And I have my own hunting school in Berlin, and I teach people to go hunt, to live with nature, and um, yeah, to learn more about nature. And yeah, that, that is my passion, that's my lifestyle, and uh, I try to, to give my philosophy to other people, to show them to live or to be one with nature, uh, yeah, what happens out there, and um, to see the conflicts, um, um, yeah, to, to produce your own food, because mm -hmm. hunting is not like you go out and shoot an animal, it's much more, uh, it's uh, the smallest part um, to, to pull the trigger, that's uh, absolutely, and so yeah, I try to give my philosophy and all um, the stuff behind um, hunting and the stories um, to other people, and um, yeah. Um, so, so let me ask you a question. I found you, we found you because you were officially at one point one of the Berlin 
I call it the pig hunters. Yes, yes. So very, I don't know right. how many people knew that the city of Berlin, in an urban environment, also had official pig hunters. Normally, it's a secret. Uh, we don't have hunters in in the city, in the right. city area. Yeah, but what, I'm one of them. And um, somebody of you, maybe you know, we have a big problem with uh, white boars in Berlin, in, in and around Berlin. And uh, you have to moderate the conflict, um, to, yeah, to teach people what can you do to protect your garden, your house, um, when they are on the playground, when they are on the highway. What do you have to do? And sometimes, yes, of course, we have to uh, take them away. So. Um, this is very, very interesting to see um, when you live in a big uh, city like Berlin and the uh, wildness is next to you. It's, mm -hmm. it's your neighbor, uh, wild boars or raccoons or uh, root deers, um, they live next to us. But when they live next to us, we also have conflicts because, you know, they look so sweet and so pretty, but when they uh, destroy your garden, you don't want them anymore in your garden. So what do we have to do next? So uh, sometimes uh, there uh, we, ha yeah, we have a, a very, very big population of white boars in and around Berlin. And that's the reason why we have to hunt them mm -hmm. and yeah, to moderate it. Thank you. Well, we'll come back with a couple other yes. questions. But now I want to come to Anya, who builds gardens in the city. I mean, this is one of the things you've been doing that he was just talking about with the, the schwein and the deers will come. Tell us a little bit more about what you do okay. and why. Yeah. Um, actually, you said it. I'm a landscape architect um, and I'm a researcher too. So at the moment, I'm working at the Technical University and we do that what we talk about here today. We do um, take care about the transfer of research results. But um, looking to my heart and my daily business, um, it's actually about creating landscapes within the urban shape. So I made gardens, but at the moment um, we do research about aquaponic and hydroponic farming and building integrated ways of um, producing food. And um, we do that because Actually, I'm loving the landscape and I, I, I feel that relationship to nature, but I think we live in a phase where nature is hardly changing. And what we have to learn is that um, the urban agriculture or the new nature is looking different. It's made by plastic, it's fish and mm -hmm. farming within the city. We use the facades and the roofs of the city itself. It's like a new picture we need to discover what we have. And, um, what I did in the last years, actually, it was a project. We went quite deeply through that discussion about aquaponic and hydroponic farming, and we used um, recycled wastewater within the city center. So we run a living lab um, near to Potsdamer Platz, and there it's possible to clean up gray water. That's the water what is coming from the um, bath tube. It's all the water which, which is not going to the toilet. And when you are separate that two flows, um, you can recycle that water in one day that it's nearly, that it has nearly drinking water quality. And um, within that buildings in the 80s, I think um, they started to reuse it within the building. And we said, okay, if it's nearly drinking water quality, why we don't farm with it? Mm -hmm. And so we started in 2016 there um, to, no, it was uh, 2030, sorry, <laughs> to, um, show that it's possible to use that surface water, it's recycled grey water, for producing fish and um, vegetables in a greenhouse um, in a small yard. And we made a lot of design research about um, which buildings could cover such an infrastructure as a new infrastructure for the city. It's a living system, it's not a pipe. It's something you can touch, something you can see, you grow food within. And you can do that on the roofs and the facades. So actually what is really, um, how to say that, driving me to do that research is a deep, um, I really believe that we have to discover the city and its resources for creating new gardens and new natures, which look not that romantical like the ones we have. It's not really landscape, it's urbanized mm -hmm. pattern. But within that urbanized pattern, we find um, we are able to see our own resources which we can recycle. And it's not just waste, it's water, it's energy, it's actually the flow, we call it the um, 
food, and food, water, energy nexus, which is really, really important looking to that urbanized landscapes you were talking about. We are far away from having some actually landscapes for urban agriculture. And coming back to my garden, uh, my heart as a gardener, um, it's a lot about biodiversity. I think we have to learn to accept wilderness um, within cities. It's not about all about food farming. It's the same what we need is place for other species to be. We really have to learn that we are not the only ones. So um, there are actors. Nature has different actors. They are right beside us. And this um, shift in understanding and creating nature is something with what is really driving me. So really, there you're talking about so closing some of the loops, yes. which we talk about the circular economy or <coughs> ecological cycles, trying to close that loop in a holistic way. Yeah. Yeah. And so and you're saying being able to live next to actors. I mean, Marcel, in a way, this is what you, you're also yes. wanting to share, is how you live with these other actors. So I want to ask you, Marcel, what's the biggest surprise when you're when people come with you to learn, what's the biggest thing that surprises those who are learning with you about nature and about hunting? Um, I would say the biggest surprise is um, they learn to see. They see mm. much more when they go outside in nature to the woods with me. Um, they will see some things you, you never saw before. And I would say hunting is teaching you to see what happens out there because you spend so much time you it's like meditating you sitting there for hours and you have so much time to look around and you will understand all the um, uh, yeah the the ecosystem much better because you're sitting there and you're waiting and you have so much time to look around and yeah I would say um, the biggest surprise for them is to see so many different things how um, animals different animals act together mm. they they live together and yeah they spend their time of course together I, I had a, a very nice picture um, I saw in the city there were white boars and raccoons in a one big group, it was two wild boars and 20 raccoons, and they moving around the street. And it was so funny because mm. it's like a movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they live and yeah, maybe also they work together. It could be a new, mov it could be a mo <laughs> new movie titled The Boars of Berlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's the double meaning there. You don't think of Berlin as a boring place. <laughs> Get it? Bad, bad, bad joke in English. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you the same question. For those you've been working with, or your students and your community members, what have you observed has been their biggest surprise when they learn about these closing those loops of the other species? Um, so the, maybe well, there are. I mean, the biggest surprise was we started as. Um, we started with research funding, and this research funding um, was about multifunctional infrastructures but it was really technology so mm. there was not really a link to nature but we created that link when we said we want to do aquaponic and hydroponic farming and we want to de um, do that uh, to and um, develop that loop so we had um, to show that there are some people would accept such a technology because it's wastewater and mm. we are coming from industrial or we have still, I think, industrial mindsets where we think this is something which goes far away and we will never come back. So um, we decided actually to do um, quite transparent work and um, opened up that greenhouse. And from the first day, we made a strawberry celebration. Mm. There were more than 300 people coming. I think we had, talking about animals, we had a little star, our fishes. We, call, we were talking about that aquaponic um, farming where you have the fishes as little stars. Um, but after that first day, until today, and it's I think more than 11 years now, we have so many visitors just coming to see that, te te that technology, just coming to um, get in touch with that water, seeing that it's possible to um, create some food there mm -hmm. and that was for me the most the greatest thing within the whole research I thought we do technology but what we did actually was communication and we discovered that doing the job and um, 
Because of that, today we develop smaller structures which actually can move to the city because this technology is really a technology which teaches us another relationship to nature. And I think this is the most important part because um, it's, it's more than food. It's like you, you are talking about the animals. It's going there, um, understanding what you are doing, understanding that once when you... Um, that the water is coming from actually the building, that you can do something there within the greenhouse. The kids, for the kids, we, we, are, we have a lot of um, young people coming from kindergartens and schools, and they look at the, the technologies, and for them it's normal. And you really see that you can mm -hmm. change the mindset, that, it's, um, that you can learn um, creating and designing that system. And, and those processes, I think, are the really really important that was the biggest surprise for me that's yeah. great that's great because in many ways there's no such thing as waste it's just another type of resource and yes. this is what you're helping them, these individuals see that, yeah. that is just a resource we have to do something with yeah but now you're both of speaking of a world which is quite different than the world you live in in the sense of gardens wild boars all around and having to manage the forest beasts. Singapore is a very dense city and it's known as a garden city, so it's not it's not green. But no I don't think many citizens have a Steriber garden or can grow tomatoes out in the garden someplace. So how how do you when you hear that so but you grew up over here. So but how do you see this when with your work? Mm -hmm. And how is Singapore relevant to say Berlin and what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. So I would partially disagree, actually, to what you were saying before, like that I'm very different from what the two of them are doing, actually, because part of our research is also looking on how can we integrate those systems that we, we are developing uh, into living areas in Singapore, because we don't just want to produce or go somewhere to Malaysia or Indonesia, produce there and ship everything uh, to Singapore, right? This is not the idea. We want to produce there and we need to find centralized uh, solutions, probably with consumers. Um, I was always dreaming of people have their 3D printer and they have their algae at home, right? And then they can just uh, do uh, tailored the printing of broccoli uh, use, using microalgae, probably sometimes in the future. And then I think also what, what we are also trying to emphasize is that, um, I mean, a, a big topic is around meat consumption and that we should reduce meat consumption. And uh, Marcel's approach is actually also what we are promoting, right? Saying having a kind of meaningful uh, consumption of meat and really thinking of where the meat comes from and having the connection and then eating meat, yes. But, yeah, thinking about it and having it, I don't know, once a week, uh, once every twice week, because uh, every second week, because it's part of our culture and it should be part of our nutrition. But just, uh, yeah, question it and um, have the have the sense uh, behind it somehow. And then, of course, Singapore is completely different from... Um, from Berlin, also meaning that uh, we see a lot that people are very disconnected from food and food production. Mm -hmm. They don't know where their food comes from. And this is then creating some issue. I mean, we need to import 90% of the food in Singapore, right? But a third still gets lost. Mm. And cheap is, uh, food is also very cheap in Singapore. So um, yeah, and uh, we realize a lot that people have a big disconnection from, from food production. Therefore, if we can implement microalgae or any kind of other solution, uh, a lot of people also do vertical farming as a solution. We have vertical shrimp farms, actually. Uh, since last year in Singapore, I started up doing that. If you can create some kind of connection to food and food production and then a more meaningful mm. or reasonable um, way of dealing with food. Uh, so this, I'm really intrigued by this. All three of you have spoken of the need for a better connection to nature, and, nat and algae is nature. Nature is a technology, and nature is what you just said there with the garden. And, and I'm intrigued by this, unexpected for me, that this, all of you would say, this is what we need. When we're rethinking urban agriculture, is to get more connected. Comment? What do you think? 
So yeah, I mean, like I commented before, right? Yeah. Uh, I feel probably it's just a feeling for me, but uh, if people don't know where their food comes from, we see it a lot with meat. People actually don't want to see where pigs are produced. So we get a lot of comments. Uh, we are producing alternative meat analogs. And then people uh, claim they're ultra processed, but actually it's not ultra processed. It's just a, a misunderstanding actually of the process that is happening. And also with food processing, we can get nutrients that otherwise we couldn't get. Um, we, we have bread, for instance, that comes from processing. So hmm. it's interesting. How many of you ask where your food comes from? How many of you know where all your food comes from? How many, how many of you know? Okay, the, the grocery store, right, okay, I get that, right? But it's a really, it's an intriguing, it's an intriguing point, which is, uh, again, this is unexpected. So, but I wanna change the tax a little bit. I wanna think, when we think the, t the theme, rethinking urban agriculture, when we rethink, say, we're looking forward, say, 20 years, when we're rethinking, what does this, in your mind or your hearts, what does this evoke? this rethinking, and yet what, what, would, what does it mean for you? Um, for me, it's, it's better now with the mic. Yeah, because yeah, okay. your hair was making yeah. it so funny. <laughs> um, I think the, the rethinking is we, we have different um, sources or other sources. We mm. have to deal with our own waste. Mm -hmm. We have to discover waste. Mm -hmm. We have to discover new food, I think. And mm -hmm. um, we have to... F to um, forget that we have urban landscapes and landscapes and agriculture. I think um, we have to think that all together and more is systematic. And this approach brings us actually, I think, to a rethinking of urban agriculture. And to, to scale that, I think, or if you don't want to fail in scaling, <coughs> for that we need the connection mm -hmm. to not make the, um, the old mistakes we made. Mm -hmm. I think this is the rethinking, for me, the most important part. And the other um, quite important part is the non-human actors, to accept that there are actors um, beside us, which um, maybe are our food or live within the city shape, or they are just... Um, they live in parts of the world which are completely, which are wild and wilderness we need because we know that we need that places. Mm -hmm. So, and this, for me, this is a new, is like a bit stepping away from nature and um, creating something new. And at the same time, um, it's more respect, I mm -hmm. think, to all those processes. Great, Great. thanks. So, Marcel, what about you? When you say rethinking urban agriculture, what does that evoke for you? Um, yeah, I think uh, hunting uh, cannot uh, contribute a uh, revolution for the, uh, for the food problem in our society, but uh, you can get a better awareness f mm -hmm. for food um, um, to produce your own meat uh, or your own food uh, like our grandparents. Um, yeah, so I think we have to uh, find out how much wilderness we want in our um, urban areas because for me it's super easy. I know a lot of, I would say, a lot of uh, our nature, uh, to be with nature, to live with um, wild animals, but I would say the most people in our society um, forgotten how to mm. Um, interact with our nature and yeah we have a big problem with white boars in and around Berlin they are not so dangerous when you know how to um, uh, how, how yeah, interact with them. to interact with them but yeah we have a new player in our habitat it's uh, a wolf so for mm. me it's super nice it's a beautiful animal but you have to decide how cool it, how cool you are with when you go to the woods with your dog and a wolf is next to you. For me, it's easy, but you have to decide. Hmm. what is it a problem for you? You know what to do? And um, this is the hmm. question we have to hmm. ask, I think. And um, yeah, it uh, doesn't will hmm. take time, so long time, that the wolf comes to Berlin because it's super easy to get food here because the wild boars and the root deers are not so, you know, they are not so shy like in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. when they find it out... Where, where I lived in California, we had, we had lots of um, missing cats. Mm. 
because we we had we had <laughs> wolves and and so that was yeah. sort of basically wolf food. Yeah. Rethinking urban agriculture for you, what does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, so I think I got um, a different understanding of urban agriculture when I moved to Singapore. So before I lived actually seven years in Zurich, which we already consider the biggest city of Switzerland, and then you move to Singapore. It's a slight <laughs> difference. So because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's only 1% of arable land. But then if you travel around Asia, I mean, I've also been to Seoul now, uh, Taipei. These are mega cities. And then you need to have completely different concepts of food production and also think about how can we integrate it, the food production with people, probably directly next to their buildings. But another topic that Anya was also um, emphasizing is the food waste. So actually in Singapore, we import 90%. What do we do with the waste? And there are no centralized, decentralized systems somehow on how we are treating the waste, but we will be generating it. Uh, and cur currently there's, uh, I think, a lot of gas production uh, with the waste. We are working also with black soldier fly larvae uh, as organic waste treatment technology where we could be using the protein from the black soldier fly larvae for more sustainable f uh, feed. Uh, it could also be food, but currently there's no food application in, in case there are very brave people in here. Um, feel free to also uh, try these uh, crawling larvae ones. Um, I did. Uh, yeah, sure, so okay. we, we have a completely different understanding then of urban agriculture. Uh, but of course, we need to combine it with more sustainable practices also of traditional agriculture, I think, which we shouldn't neglect. So mm. it cannot only be novel resources, novel approaches such as vertical farming, because they cost a lot of energy still. Yeah. Annie, go ahead. Yes, I want to, um, um, I think another rethinking, another part, um, quite important part, is the climate change. Right. We have to think that together with all the challenges we have just looking to climate change. For instance, in Berlin, I mean as a local, when we have the strong rainfalls in Berlin, all the fishes in the rivers are dying because our um, wastewater infrastructure system is collapsing. And this is not th something easy. Mm -hmm. And um, to face all that wicked problems together and to develop integrated solutions, I think this is rethinking urban agriculture. Urban agriculture is, or rethinking it is climate adaption and climate change. We have to think about new practices, maybe some flooded, I don't know, fields, some um, something in the facades or on the roofs or mm -hmm. different food. And um, to understand that, that we are actually facing a, a complex crisis and developing solutions for that. This is, I think, rethinking urban agriculture. That's a really great point, is because we have a new context we're all walking into. Sometimes sleepwalking, but the reality is we are looking at a say, two to four degree change in, in the temperature, depending on where you are in Europe. I mean, in Switzerland, we're going to have experience 4.2 degrees when the rest of the world is at 1.5 or so. Mm. And this has massive impacts on the contextual parameters to rethink. Now, you just said before, and you were talking about the systems, looking at this a holistic systems, I've well, been trying to think of this integration. And as that changes, uh, I think that's a really, really, really interesting point. I'd like to ask this uh, for e in the room or online, if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask at this point. I see one hand, there's one online, that's two. When we get to 10, then, I, then we're going to go for it. We've got three. OK, we're going to get one more question, and I'm going to come, come to you all. OK. Um, Anna, you mentioned uh, also when we were talking ahead of time about some of the work on the roof water farming strategies and where that might go and your hope with bringing folks in that they're going to see these kind of opportunities. Do you see other places in the world where this is happening already? Do you know of any other places where this is a more common practice or is this something you're, you're trying to hoping to, to, to spread? Well, um, I'm st I, I start laughing because um, Berlin is not really a modern city. So everywhere in the world, I think it's, <laughs> this is really happening. And um, in, in Berlin, the roof water farming practices we um, we develop are some, but there is a lot missing. But I think if you look to some big cities which are able to 
to um, adapt to climate change, for instance, and they start to um, use rainwater and to understand that maybe a um, children's playground can be flooded and that you can um, live with that. And um, I think those cities, or well, Singapore is a good um, example for farming, but um, to really understand what a city itself can do to adapt to all that questions, I think you have to integrate all that other water issues, um, like rainwater, for instance. So this is what I'm meaning um, with the climate change. We start to discuss blue-green infrastructure, building integrated farming, and I think we are on the point where we start to understand that we develop new integrated um, technologies and then we, mm -hmm. that we develop new systems for the urban planet, actually. And Berlin is not on the, um, not, Berlin is not really doing a lot with it, with all that. Not I mean, yet. Not yet, maybe, okay. uh, hopefully tomorrow, but at the moment I think it's, uh, we live in a time, uh, political-wise, it's going, it's a world back. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so, um, to answer your questions, yes, there are a lot of other places. Okay, cool. So, questions. Here, one, two, three. Now we have enough questions to start going. Okay. Um, microphone. If we can go ahead and start with the, up here on the front left, and I have a couple in Slido. If you're online, you're welcome to put them into the Slido or the YouTube. Please go ahead and do those, and then I'll, I'll scrape them here. Go ahead, and if you can stand up as you're doing, thank you. That helps with that, and please make sure it's a question and not a a long statement. Yeah, thank you so much you get like, one. Uh, for the discussion. Yeah. Uh, so I was just like directly like on the last statement what you were saying, like um, so maybe like Berlin wants to be climate neutral city by 2045. And um, do you see this can be reachable like with maybe integrating more like green blue infrastructures? But like what is there the drive? also for the government, because I'm working for the government, and it's not easy to implement uh, the stuff, which is like the technology is there, but uh, it's not the implementation takes so long. Mm -hmm. And what, how we can accelerate the process? Great question, thank, thank you. you. Directly answer? You can go yeah. for it, right. Yeah. Um, Last month I went to a conference about blue-green infrastructure and that um, there was a keynote about, um, there were a lot of pictures of Stockholm, for instance, where it's already possible to construct blue-green infrastructures to bring the rainwater to the trees and not to the pipes. And um, the whole day um, was a discussion about um, how to renew all that streets. And in Berlin we faced the problem that the we have those huge pressure of creating um, places to live. We have all that construction sites and sometimes I have the feeling nothing is going on. So I think if we would learn um, how to integrate all the people, for instance, to, to change a street, it's maybe you need an engineer, but if you ask a lot of other people to help to develop a new infrastructure, the neighbors, the kids, then I think we can be. Then it will be easier. But this um, to go. This is actually the, the the bigger picture of participation and a bigger picture of knowledge transfer. And it's a, a stepping out of the idea that we need a lot of experts to do that. I, I'm really sure that we have the solutions. What we have to learn is to integrate a lot of people into that process mm -hmm. to get more faster. Because it's not that, um, it's easy. We know how it goes. We know we see the trees dying. We know that the rain is, rainwater is falling down and we just have to bring it to the trees. We see the farmers, we have two aquaponic farms in Berlin and we know the technology. So um, the Berliner Wasserbetriebe, I don't know what's that in English, mm. they say Berlin will become a sponge city, but we need a huge amount of money. I don't believe that. We need people to work on this, and we need to find that people to do that. Mm. And I think this is the part we have to learn. It's not engineering. It's taking care about the urban shape and stepping into that huge transformation we have to do. To unlock the public potential. There's also some legal parts too. Like in Hong Kong, I lived in Hong Kong, you always every toilet was flushed with seawater, not with fresh water. 
Like, why flush your toilet with drinking water? It's kind of stupid, actually. But, you know, but you have to have the pipes to do that. And that's part of the, it's illegal. There's also legal requirements for that. So I have a question here online, which is really quite intriguing for me. For you, is uh, is COVID influence, how did, how, did COVID, it, how did COVID influence all of your thinking and all of your work? Did COVID have any impact on your research and your thinking about this, or? I mean, yeah, this is a, one of the reasons that Singapore is really putting so much pressure on increasing domestic food production. Hmm. Okay. Because they were facing so many supply chain disruptions, and if you import 90% of your food, um, you're heavy, heavily reliant on all these imports. And then uh, when COVID happens, of course, um, Singapore was heavily impacted by that. So they wanted to increase uh, or decided to increase domestic food production. So it's really a um, national critical yeah, they, yeah, I mean, yeah, they see like uh, yeah. how dependent they are and they want to reduce that. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I often wonder how long we'll be able to import tomatoes from drought stricken places like, uh, like Spain, because basically you're exporting water. And how does that make sense? You know, it's like, anyway. So, Marcel, what about for you? When, how did COVID impact your yes, uh, there was a very big impact because uh, so many people had so much time, mm. and um, also, yeah, they, they. So your business boomed. My business boomed. Yes, <laughs> okay. of course. Um, Interesting. Yeah, uh, I'm not, I'm not kidding, because uh, the the people want uh, a connection back to to nature, and mm. so my business was uh, absolutely super fine and yeah uh, the the people want the connection back to nature to um, produce uh, their own meat their own uh, food and um, yes it was a i would say a very positive impact in my business so before i come to you Anya, you have an antler in front of you yeah and tell us why you brought that and because it, it's about as old as COVID in a sense, isn't it, or no? Yeah, I bring this uh, antler with me um, to show you how long does it take a uh, red deer um, is ready um, to harvest. Uh, this one is 10 years old now. He's still alive. Uh, a red deer uh, loses his antler every year and it takes three until five months to build it new. So. Uh, for for me as a hunter, mm. it's very important to look what happens out there to uh, find out uh, which root deer is ready to harvest, which is good for the population, and which one we can uh, take out for producing mm. like sausage, meat, uh, stuff like this. Yeah, so and it's it's a long time and it's very heavy and uh, it shows you. Mm. Uh, how fascinating um, the nature mm. nature is. Mm. So yeah, that was the reason why I bring you this. So they, they these they they knock these off and they make a new one every year. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Mm. That's crazy. It yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot, it's of, a lot work. of calcium. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Where do they get the calcium to do this? Or I don't know. This is like, anyway. Yeah, with the nutrient. Okay. Yeah. And what about you for COVID? And I just want to add something. Um, my kids, we saw a, a show about that thing here, yeah, and um, maybe you know that better than me. When it's growing, it, it's covered by some... Um, yeah, for fuzz. Until the last moment before it falls down, it's covered to not yeah, yeah, get yeah. Um, hurt. It's incredible what nature is creating. I mean, yeah. yeah. True. Absolutely. So Sorry, go ahead. You want to answer? No, no, you're okay. absolutely right. So, yeah, yeah. COVID. T tell Anya for you, COVID. How did it? How did this is a question about this kind of curious. Yeah. Yeah. COVID. Um, actually, uh, for me, it's more a private um, thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I realize I have two children, so I try to work and to stay at home. And um, they were four, I think, four and five years old within mm -hmm. that time. But. Um, Professional-wise, we, we did actually um, a lot of international teaching. So we had the Roof Water Farm publications, we had a MOOC online, and we started to give some sem seminars and to do the, actually bring the knowledge to, um, to an international scale. And that was really um, a good work. Mm -hmm. There was, um, I think, a, a point where you could talk to everybody somewhere within that, um, on that planet. And we all felt um, that problem and everybody stayed at home and had the feeling I have to do something I have mm -hmm. to change something we have 
actually a crisis. And that for me was the most important part because you could feel that we are able to react, that we are able to manage a crisis, that we are able to change. And um, I thought this will stay, but and looking to that, um, on, uh, I think no. today we, we are back to normality. Yeah. Whatever normal is, we will just say we've kind of forgotten our, our collective potential. There are about a few more other questions here in the back there. Go ahead, and then, and then we'll come up, and then we'll put this way up here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the panel. Uh, I just have a question because I work as an ESG manager for a real, real estate company, and uh, we're doing so many manage measures regarding uh, sustainability, and one topic is the biodiversity. But the problem is we don't really have an actual tangible uh, return on investment. So what could be the return, return on investment, especially that we're not focusing into the food production, but more or less the supporting species within specific areas? So what do you think of that? Go ahead, <laughs> if you want. I think, I think the, um, it's, it, Actually, it's, it's health you bring to the people which live there. This is actually the, what will happen. And um, it's, it's, um, from, I think it's taking care about the place and creating, um, creating places where you actually feel that it's in summer not hot, that you have the animals around you. It's creating different places. I think this is the most important thing. Hmm. Any other comments from anyone? Okay, we're gonna keep going. Here's another question right here, the plaid shirt, and then we're gonna come right, no, uh, behind, next to the camera. There we go. Thank you. Um, funny question, maybe. Um, <clears throat> we have learned today that um, <laughs> meeting wolves in, in the woods is, is a part of the rethinking urban agriculture. Um, as I do not feel so far so at ease with meeting wolves, I would like um, <clears throat> to know whether you could give a very quick introduction what to do in this case. <laughs> <laughs> I go for hunting um, <laughs> mushrooms <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, all of a sudden I have such an encounter. <laughs> I need to say that it's very good because there are also more and more wolves in Switzerland. So if you go hiking, you should be aware that... Okay, this is, sounds like so this is a very some, critical uh, skill which we need to yes. transfer right <laughs> yeah. now. So no, Normally, uh, they are super shy and they will uh, move away when they hear you. So when you're very loud, uh, when you uh, search for much mushrooms, it's, I would say, uh, the best thing. Um, yeah, and don't, uh, don't come too close. Uh, it's, a, it's a wild animal. It's not like a dog. They maybe look sweet and they uh, look very uh, fascinating um, and uh, they're very close, but try to give, give them space and don't, don't uh, push them in, uh, in a direction. Go back, be a little bit loud that uh, the wolf can hear you and then you will not have a problem. So normally it's super easy, but um, yeah, a lot of people um, yeah, uh, forgot how to live with animals. I mean, it's super easy for you to say, I'm sure for the rest of us, <laughs> if we would see a wolf, maybe, we'd maybe you back, just back, you look at in the eye and you back up or do you just turn around and run or what? You no, you, you, you be very, very, I would say slow in your movements. Uh -huh. okay. So don't be uh, nervous or something like that. Yeah, of course, it sounds so easy, but uh, yeah. that's, uh, that's the point. Yeah. Um, that's the it. point they'll how they'll to live it. with animals, yeah. uh, with wild animals. And in Germany or in Europe, it's much easier than in Asia or in Africa. You have uh, much more dangerous animals uh, next to your door uh, yeah. than a wolf. It's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's so funny, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, funny is not necessarily the word I think I might use with that one, but okay, that's a, that's a really good point. You always say when you see bears, I know when you go hiking in the Rockies, you're supposed to be very loud, you carry a bell and you talk, you know, loudly. Yeah. So for those who like to walk quietly through a forest, it's sort of the opposite, and this is intriguing. There's a question right here, and then I have another one online, and then we're going to swing around to the other side. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
I see urban agriculture as a potential climate solution. And for me, as a journalist, I look for certain factors uh, when, it, when it comes to climate solutions. First, feasibility. Two, scalability. Three, sustainability. And four, conservability. So, what was the fourth one? Conserve, conservation point of view, uh -huh. conservability. Yep. So if you were to give scores on your respective fields, you know, um, like in Singapore or uh, in Berlin or hunting, what would be your scores of all these four factors? I'm writing up the scorecard right <laughs> here. Here are the factors. Yeah, all right, the first uh, one. Uh, like uh, all together or like a, like a general score? Yep. So, feasibility, scalability, sustainability, conservability. That's its relationship with nature, I'm assuming. Yeah, its relationship with nature. Feasibility, machbarkeit. Ob das machbar? And then scalability, kann man das? Yeah. And then nachhaltig, sustainable. And then conservability, what's its relationship to nature and, and species? And yeah, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, I can go for that. So usually what we encounter is that uh, m most people say alternative protein based on precision fermentation microalgae is more sustainable. It's, it's a super sustainable solution. Always if you hear that, you should be critical because currently all these solutions are not more sustainable in terms of, in terms of um, energy consumption, for instance, if you compare it to soy or even chicken because these are highly optimized systems over years. Mm -hmm. So, but we are not anymore in basic research uh, level. So if we look at the technology <coughs> readiness level, we are somehow, so we are beyond basic research. There is upscale going on. And if we have more upscaling, more economy of scale, as we always say, we can also decrease uh, the costs and improve the sustainability effect. But then for the microalgae or other um, cultured, cultured meat, for instance, you always need to look at the energy consumption and we need to find more sustainable Mm. energy actually for fueling also all that because then if you use still traditional energy sources it is still questionable right whether these are really more sustainable solutions so they're not yet probably uh, there to be implemented in the next year or the next two years but probably in 10 years 15 years but they are not yet basic research anymore mm. so as I understand you're an innovation curve you're still we're still on the on the upper part, right? We're not, we're not, as you said, you're not quite to the scaling part yet, and yeah. you're still the system still needs to evolve around you. Yeah. So what we actually look at is usually the technology readiness level. Yeah. So at a scale that is developed by NASA, or, um, where we look at is it basic research, is it close to application, is it industrializable? Right. And usually before industrialization, you have some kind of dip that we call the valley of death, yeah. that a lot of technologies get lost. So in Singapore, we are working more towards the application, mm -hmm. towards industrialization, that we don't have this dip. We are working on the right side of, of this dip, actually. Mm -hmm. And there are companies in Israel that are upscaling microalgae production. Mm -hmm. So technologies are, are there. We just need to do it at scale, I think. So. I'm not sure if this was addressed to all three. It was mostly, mostly the IRS, right? <laughs> Just two of the, okay, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sustainability, I did. And conservability, it was relationship to conservation. Must so, good, to, to right? nature conservation in yeah. general? I mean, we are in Singapore. <laughs> okay, enough said. There we go. All right. So, <laughs> so I mean, the, the, probably previously there was, uh, was a lot of biodiversity, but in, in theory, what we are developing uh, are solutions that are independent of arable land. What we could be using is already existing stainless steel tanks that you, for instance, use for beer brewing. And then, then we go to the underground to void spaces that are currently not used, they're just empty. So that would be our idea. And then you can use the arable land for. Uh, reforestation or for yeah other getting uses. biodiversity in again cool yeah. um, did you want the others to answer this or are you happy with yours okay <laughs> you're satisfied at the moment do either of you want to go for this one as well the first one feasibility um, so uh, 
But we are there. It's constructible. Um, you actually there in Berlin. There are two buildings. Um, and last year they, they have this this grey water treatment within the building and um, place left for the farm coming. Um, this technology, the roof water farm technology, um, needs someone working with it. So it doesn't make any sense to produce fish or herbs when you, when you um, if you don't have anybody using that things. So talking about scalability, um, we discovered that it's a quite diverse technology. So it's possible to run a restaurant with an aquaponic farming, a small restaurant. At the same time, you can run a social housing. Or there was the, actually um, the next step we will do. You bring it to a school building and teach um, the children that questions you can teach with that technology. So it's not scalable until there. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's bringing diversity. And for me, this is the main shift. And um, what else? Feasibility, scalability? Sustainability. Sustainability. Using wastewater or service water for farming makes completely sense. And um, if you, for instance, um, we made a, we made network maps, imagining that you will bring that farms to the places where the city is producing waste heat, abwärme. Mm -hmm. um, so every big um, treatment plant can have a farm. Hmm. So. And this is bringing more and more sustainability, and you learn to cross the loop. We have a small farm at um, a beach site here in Berlin at Gleis Dreieck Park. There where you can play beach volleyball, then you go showering, and then the, you shower water that's going through the vertical farm. You can see your salad growing, and then you can um, earn your salad, go to the restaurant and eat the burger, and then you have closed the loop. And so I think this is... 100 points. <laughs> and the um, conservation part, um, at our living lab at Potsdamer Platz, we combine the technology with an urban swamp. So we bring mm. parts of the gray water into a uh, um, mm. wetland to cool down the city. And um, combining that practices with blue-green infrastructure for rainwater, for instance, or gray water or that swamps, it's bringing diversity and it's incredibly beautiful to walk through the wetlands in the middle of the city center. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sorry, it's a, in German we say Eigenlob stinkt, but <laughs> I don't know what's that in English. Bosch <laughs> Yeah, of course, maybe I can give you a very simple example uh, out of my point of view. Um, uh, it's winter, it's cold outside, uh, you have a fireplace at home, of course you need wood. Yeah, you have to go out uh, in the forest to cut down a tree, to bring it home, chop it into pieces, and then you have to wait two years until you can burn it. So to cut a long story short, it's a lot of work. So when it's winter now, you're sitting on the sofa and you are freezing and you have a look to your fireplace and the wood. You will remember how much work it was to bring the wood to your place. And I promise you will go upstairs put a polo, uh, um, a sweater on, and yeah, for me, it's the point, I don't have to eat meat every day or uh, avocado from uh, everywhere. It's, sometimes it's much more simple um, to find a solution and uh, to think about how we act in our society. So, yeah. It's a great answer. Thank you for that. May I ask something? Sure. You, you ever ahead. thought about tiny forests within the city? Pardon? You ever thought about tiny forests? So we have that small, you know, tiny forests? No. So it's, uh, I'm okay. Maybe we talk about that <laughs> okay, later. Maybe okay, maybe later. We'll, we'll go for that afterwards. <laughs> more questions. We have a couple more questions here. We have one, you go ahead, this gentleman right here, and then we're going to go around. Okay, we'll get you, and then we're going to go on this side. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm very interested in aquaponics. So um, first, a question for Anya. Um, you talked about all these fascinating facilities. Where can I find them? Maybe there is a website, and how, how can I visit them? Um, the second, I guess, is a little you, bit more. You get one question. One question. Uh, OK. Um, <laughs> one question. Well, about aquaponics, what are the uh, challenges, or what are the advantages that we can see maybe also in Singapore or in Berlin? OK. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a mean guy, I know, terrible. And we'll get the check shirt next, and we're going to run here. Aquaponics or you know, any, any thoughts? 
Go ahead. So in Berlin, we have, I think, two big aquaponic farms. It's Efficient City Farming in Tempelhof, and it's the um, Stadt Farm in, where is it? Ah, if you check Köpenick, I think, yeah. Mugelsee, I think so. Yeah, so both of them do um, aquaponic farming on an industrial scale. And both of them, I think the um, efficient city farming, they bring it to supermarkets and um, Stadt Farm is running a small shop. So, and there are a lot of aquaponic farms worldwide which struggle because they become too big. So I think the mm. most important part in aquaponic farming is that you understand who needs the product, why you do that, and what kind of water you use. Hmm. We are the only ones um, working with service water. And hmm. you are working with animals, and you need actually um, that relationship. Is, it's, it's not just abstract food production. It's aquaponic farming for someone. And I think this is the most important part. Hmm. And for sure, it's all about that. It's the same with... Um, the vertical farms, you have to think about the energy you use if you run it in summer and winter, or if you close it in winter, and that's, you have to think it as a loop. And um, in Berlin, there we have that farms. And you can come to the roof water farm. You can, we can show you the technology. There are a lot of aquaponic farms growing at the moment, but um, mm. they point. have to be diverse. I think that's the most important part. Great. Thank you. It's very good. Any comment on Singapore if you keep going? Um, yeah, I think uh, Singapore now taps more and more into doing that uh, because they want to be independent also in their fish supply. So they have different strategies there and they also do the aquaponics. What we look more at is actually the feed that uh, are provided to the fish, which is again black soldier fly larvae that we are trying to rear on organic waste that you find around uh, in Singapore, so having kind of uh, food waste or organic waste treatment technology, and then using these larvae as more sustainable feed for the, for the fish in the aquaponics. Hmm. Interesting. But I'm not an expert in that, unfortunately. Hmm. Very interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Gen yes, sir. Thanks for the second chance, knowing that... On oh, wait a minute, you already had one. You put your hand up again, you sneaky enough. guy, you. No, not at all. Oh. <laughs> um, a question to Anya. Um, as, as, as you just said, that Berlin is um, <coughs> a little bit not in advance with um, proceeding. Um, could you give us just your three best of examples of other cities when, when we um, want to look it up tonight after, after the session here um, to get m more um, inspiration in, in which directions to think? Three. I think the f it's not about aquaponic farming, but it's about using um, the roofs and the facades and the buildings and, and bringing it to actually to adapt it to climate change. It's Paris. Just look what um, the ma ma major is doing at the moment and how big the farms grow and what they allow. Um, I think Stockholm is developing quite well in case of how can we reconstruct the city and develop um, blue-green infrastructure. I'm, I'm not sure if they have farming. And actually, Singapore is always our um, example for thinking urban agriculture on the bigger scale. Mm. And yeah, okay. just I think if you do, there are a lot of small farms growing at the moment. And um, I said that about Berlin because I was born here and I saw what the, how the city developed in the last years. And um, yeah, that's why I said we are not the best ones. But I would Good. love that we could be like Paris in ca case of regulation understanding of what the buildings are. Stockholm, I think, is quite intelligent and in redesigning infrastructure. And Singapore is rethinking urban agriculture. Yeah, it's great, great examples. You know, it's quite interesting because about 10 or 15 years ago, Singapore decided to try to capture every single drop of rain which fell on the nation. And so they really started thinking, how can we do this as part of the scheme for rethinking their urban water system, including what they call new water, which is the first time they started reusing water for human or secondary consumption. So it's, it's actually this rethinking the systems which we have around us. And I think this is quite, quite interesting as assets. There's a question right here. Yep. Luna, you had a question? And then we're going to go walk our way back. Hi. 
Um, my question is maybe more technological. If you have tried or experienced with aeroponics. Aeroponics. Any? No. 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 Okay. We have. Um, we at the Roof Water Farm Living Lab, we work with students, so they take the basic technologies we developed and develop them further. And there was a, um, actually, a, I think it was a master thesis about aeroponics, but I don't have, we never did it by ourselves. But it's the same, I think it makes sense because it's just developing new systems. Mm -hmm. And there's another system to be thinking, like as we rethink urban agriculture, there's many different things, mm -hmm. little pieces of the puzzle we've got to think about depending on where we are in the world. It also makes sense for different things. Yes, sir, here in the front row. Um, yep, go ahead, just talk. He'll catch you. Hey, um, I have a question. I have at home some little patches for growing my own food. And over the year, I get like percentage of five to for own vegetables and my question goes probably to you, Iris, and I would like to know if there's a concrete estimate for how much can we afford when we would apply the current best technologies to Singapore, if we have vertical things to grow, salad, whatever, and rooftop farming for all buildings, if there's a, like, a limit we can so the, perce the percentage that you think could like be replaced? If you say you uh, import like 90% to Singapore of food, so what is the best we can do with vertical farming and all the stuff we can, like cherry trees instead of whatever uh, trees we have now? Uh, what is the upper bound mm -hmm. of we can do? I think it's not possible to do 100%, but well, depends. is there anything we know? Good question. Anya, why don't you go ahead, because you look like you want to grab that, and then Iris, I'll let you, then you go. I don't know if that's really the question, but we made a study within Roof Water Farm about um, how many food can produce a farm on a five, um, on a story. five, five store building, and um, with, uh, I think, 60 people live, live in. And the Roof Water Farm technology would um, de deliver 80% of fish to the people living in the building, mm -hmm. and up to 60% of the vegetables. So it's quite a lot, yep. and then, yeah. So, but um, it's one building. You th I think you have to t have to think it on a neighborhood scale. But it's, mm -hmm. it's a huge potential. Yeah, I don't have uh, like definite numbers on that actually. But uh, I just know that in the current status, actually, uh, technologies like vertical farming wouldn't provide you uh, with most crops that we are using. Like soy in Asia, we consume so much tofu. But doing vertical farming for soy is not very meaningful. So um, yeah, so currently it's mainly herbs and leafy vegetables. So then we would still need external supply, also in terms of meat, if you still want uh, chicken. It will be very difficult, really, for highly urbanized environments. And then for the microalgae, actually, uh, that doesn't relate to the work that I'm doing now, but what I was doing in my PhD, I was supporting the University of Stuttgart for developing life support systems for Mars or Moon missions, where they're using microalgae to create really circular loops, because you can also use gray water or uh, urine uh, recycle it and grow the microalgae on it. And they actually estimated, I think, with a five liter reactor, you could supply a third of what a human needs, uh, fi uh, five or two 10 liter reactor, which is already uh, a lot if you have a, I don't know, eight billion people population, mm -hmm. right? But only a third because of the nutrients also that are in the microalgae. And not one source can supply uh, all the nutrients that you need. But I don't have a definite number on that, unfortunately. That's a very interesting thing. It's very interesting question because urine is an incredibly good fertilizer. Yeah, but if I would do a survey in the group, I mean, you were laughing before when Anya was mentioning, right, that she's using grey water for producing leafy vegetables for producing burgers, and then you were laughing, right? So if I would ask people now, how open would you be to, to eat something that was actually grown on your urine? We did that, actually. Really? <laughs> we did that. We developed with the Roof Water Farm over four years a fertilizer made from black water, from the water which is coming from the toilets. Yeah. And we um, did measurements if it's hygienically safe. 
it is hygienically safe. So the products we developed were actually as well as good, good as well as the ones you can buy in the supermarket, which are not wrapped in plastic. And all the people which were visiting us and saw that didn't had any problem because you could really. really. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was always facing that argument, because then uh, something like microalgae, it w if it would be safe, if there are no antibiotics, other um, yeah. residues from uh, drugs in the water, for instance, microalgae would be perfect. Currently, we grow them in food industry side streams, because they're technically uh, safe for usage. Mm. Yeah. But then we could really do a nice loop there, if people are open to consuming that food. Maybe one, one technical aspect to that um, question. When you start to, to um, reuse the water or to do the fertilizer decentralized and in small amounts, it's easy. The water we, um, which came out of our treatment plant was much more better than the ones from the centralized system. So I think the key is decentralization of the wastewater systems mm -hmm. to reuse the water flows like black water urine. Sort of rethinking back into microgrids. So in many of us back to the future, right? Where we only ate meat on Sundays, if, if at all, and then really truly lived with nature. We have time for one more question, and then there's a gentleman here in the back in the middle. He's been, he hasn't quite been dancing in his chair, but he's been trying to get that my attention for a while. So now you got it on the right-hand side. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is, we're, um, a lot of the solutions we're looking into, um, they're um, technology-based and uh, pretty energy-intensive as well. Um, what do you guys think about um, the tangibility of um, solutions such as uh, food forests and um, you know going back to traditional farming as it was before the agricultural revolution? Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting question. Okay, so this is more like to you if you're going back to the future. One of you. Marcel, what do you think? Yeah, I would say uh, it's a super good idea because our grandparents uh, uh, teach us so much about uh, gathering, to go hunting, to produce our own um, food, local food. So I would say uh, it's the best idea um, uh, uh, for the future to, to produce food next to the city, in the city. So I would say uh, mm. a lot of people will have a lot of fun to see growing uh, the vegetables and um, stuff like that. So yeah, I, hopefully it's the future. So Anya, go ahead and then I'm gonna, we're gonna have to bring, I just realized we're out of time. Yeah. So you go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. actually it's a, I think it's a good idea. It's maybe we are talking about technology, but um, it's integrated, developing integrated solutions and tiny forests and food forests are following the same way. They, de they offer different possibilities for the people living in the city and they produce maybe energy <laughs> um, or food or places for recreation, sure. I'm not envisioning a complete uh, future based on technology. It's practices we have to redevelop and redesign. So with that, I'd like to say just to close on a, a couple things. We just, for me, the answer to that one, for many of the things we've been asking very directly, it depends. Can we feed ourselves just from our food on our roofs? It depends on how much we eat. If we eat a thousand calories a day, easy. Right? I mean, it's really, it's, it, I was just in Mexico City a few weeks ago, it's 22 million people. There's no green space anywhere, you know. So I'm not sure how we're gonna be able to get to growing your food right next to you. So I, I, I'm not quite sure here, Yes, and in many places that we live at this moment, this is very inspirational for me to hear also your ideas about how we can do this. And, and I think we have to be very careful. No one's suggesting this is a solution for the world. This is a contextual, c contextual conversation here in Berlin is what we're thinking about with some inspiration from Singapore about how these systems can work together. And I think this is something which the lessons teach us again and again is place matters and the context matters, the culture, the environment. And so this is something I think it's important to take away as well, as in addition to what you've been sharing. This has been, for me, an incredibly interesting and a wonderful journey with you. Um, thank you all, Iris, Marcel, and Anya, for being here with us this evening at the ETH Rethinking Urban Agriculture in the, in the Berlin Science Week. So let us thank them the normal way. <laughs> And
Again, um, I would really like to thank all of you for choosing to be here on this evening. Um, all of us have many things we can be doing in our lives, and you chose to come and with us rethink something which is very dear to all of us, which is our nutrition and how we live our lives. So thank you for choosing to be here at the museum and also online. It's wonderful to have you with us and for your incredibly great questions. So again, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of day. And... Um, Eat an apple, drink water, be healthy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.